Hey everybody, I'm Tom Vassell, and welcome to 7 Short Game Reviews, where I'm just going to be taking a look at these games, giving kind of a short overview, and talking about them, and I'll tell you what I think. So let's get started. First we have Marvel Word Around. I reviewed Word Around years ago, uh, a long time ago I think, almost a decade, in which you're just flipping a card over and finding a word on that card. That's it. But this one's Marvel. Let me show you. So on every card in this game, there's words around all three of these, and you have to find that word. So the first one, you would find it around the outside of the word. So this one is Miles Morales. See it? Starts there. Miles Morales. The first person to get the, the card is going to take it, turn it over, and you look at the color in the back. Ah, gray. So now we look at the gray word here, which looks like stra strike air. No, air strike. Ho, ho. Then I turn that one over. It's another red. So we're back up to here. Fantastic. Got it. Back to red. And you just keep doing that. The colors on the back of the card, which you can see have lots of different characters. They put a lot of different art into this game. Just show the color of the ring you're supposed to read. Whoever says it first gets the card, and whoever gets 10 cards first is the winner. I've always liked Word Around, and I like Marvel. Of course, not every Marvel game is good. But what's interesting about this one is... Yes, you will have a major advantage if you're a Marvel fan, per se, but I played this with my wife, who is not a huge Marvel fan, and she was doing just as well as me, because a lot of the words are not Marvel, and even if they aren't, she might be like, well, who is Stephen Strange? I'm like, well, there you go, he's, he's in the Marvel Universe. But if I turn this one over here, the, the, the blue word here is um, hammer. Hammer is a word anyone can figure out. It's just a quick find the word, works well. Me and my family played it, we enjoyed it. I would give Marvel Word Around a seven out of 10. Quick to play, quick to pull out, nice art. And if you're a Marvel fan, it helps. If you're not a Marvel fan, then go find regular Word Around, you'll enjoy it. Marble Garble. Sounds like a dentist is making, says, oh man, it sounds like you have Marble Garble in your mouth. Marble Garble is a game in which you are almost like panning for gold. You've marbled in a tray and you're trying to get them all off, except some of them. Let me show you. In this game, you're going to take turns uh, with teams, or you can just play it on your own. You'll pick a card. So this card will tell you what marbles you start with. So here I start with six pink and six blue marbles. If it's gray, you can pick any color marbles you want. Or maybe it might be all the marbles, like this one here. You can play with a timer or without a timer, but this will also show you where these three pieces that are magnetic go on the board. You'll then take this blue part and pull it up and just tilt it so that all the marbles are now in here. And since this top here kind of is slightly indented, so the marbles will roll to the middle. Now, I have to get off all but one blue marble. Okay, so let's see, I can get rid of most of the marbles pretty easily, right? There's a lot of the marbles gone. This is not too so good for me since I've gotten, there we go. I got rid of all but one blue marble. And if you're playing, you can play, like I said, with a timer. And then this card is worth one point. So there's no solution to these, like a lot of puzzle games. It's just doing it, but they get harder. You know, here, I need to keep on five pink and five blue and get rid of the rest. And they get trickier with the setups and some other things. Like here, I need three yellow on one side, three green on the other side. Oh, man. So they get harder and harder, but they're also worth more points. That's how you play. Big fan, uh, incidentally, of the storage of this game. In the back of it, underneath, you can flip it over, all the pieces fit in, and then there's a plastic piece that you put on here, and it just holds everything in place, which for these kind of games is usually a little rare. This game is fun. As soon as I saw it, I knew I would enjoy it, just the aspect of that. I don't know how often I'll play it as a game, in the sense of I'm playing other people other than a puzzle. I can do pretty well at this game, but those hard ones are hard, and when you add the minute time limit, that makes them, I think, even more difficult. But this feels fun. If you have kids who like marbles and things, or puzzles, or just you and yourself want to do it, it's a neat little nifty device, and the whole idea of letting a few things off without every, with, with not everything, I found to be pretty fun. It's also quick, simple. There's no solutions to it. You just got to figure out how to do it. That's Marble Garble. Um, this one I would give a 7 out of 10 to. Flutter, a game about butterflies. So Flutter is from Phase Shift games, and most of Phase Shift games involve the dropping things on the table. Flutter does not do that. 
Uh, instead, you're going to be placing tiles next to each other with different butterflies and bugs on them, except these tiles are oddly shaped. In this game, there's going to be one spot that everyone's going to be building the different petals on, and then you'll have these piles here in the middle. On your turn, you will move the sun clockwise, although if you have the petals, you can pay to skip and go to the next tile, one yellow, then two purples, then three reds, then four purples if I want to come all the way back to where I started, which is pretty expensive. But whatever you go, you're going to take the top tile of that one, and you're going to connect it here to at least one side in the middle. Now when you connect it, you are trying to make color match flowers. So if I color match these two flowers here, for example, I would get three purple uh, petals, and three blue petals. If I did this, on the other hand, I would get three blue petals, but here I would have to pay two red and one purple petal. So I'm gonna have to pay if the colors don't match. Now later on when you connect the tiles, let's say later on someone went to do this, if they connected this, they would have to pay two reds and a yellow, but here they would get the tile because there already is red in this flower. So players are going to be placing these tiles, and again, as long as you match different sides, you're going to be fine. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to enclose tiles. So when a tile is completely enclosed, and let's just quickly enclose a tile here. So when a tile is completely enclosed, whatever it might be, let's say something's down here. First of all, if there's any empty spaces when you're finished placing your tile, you'll flip water tiles over and take the bonuses on them, whether they are points, pollen points, that's how you win the game, or you get some petals. But when you enclose a tile, you will get the points in that tile, and they're basically these little white dots here, if you can pay for them. So if I enclose this big giant tile here, I would get six points if I can pay six blue petals. Um, and if I can't, then everyone else gets half of those points for free. So don't enclose a tile unless you can pay for it. Also, at the end of your turn, you can put a B on any tile that's not enclosed. And if someone else encloses that, including you, you'll get two points and then you can put the B somewhere else. And then at the end of the game, uh, when, a tile, when some of the piles of tiles are gone, you also get points based on where your petals have shown up at the end of the game. And whoever has the most points is the winner. The odd shape of the tiles is something that really attracts me to this. The moving around in the middle with the sun, usually you want to take the next tile. I've skipped one. I think I, I, I skipped two, but I wouldn't skip more than that. Those extra costs seem ridiculous. So there's some interesting things here. You want to get your petals up high in each of the colors. So you want to match colors. As an as a side, I think the matching color flower thing is not particularly intuitive. Matching ones that are the same color is fine. Matching ones that aren't the same color where you lose petals is not, but you need to do it sometimes because otherwise you're not going to place things out. So that's going to take a bit to wrap your mind around. I like it, but it, it's going to be a little odd. Usually you match stuff and it's perfect. Here it's a little imperfect. And especially with the tiles being imperfect and how they're placed out there. So there's some weird stuff that can go on. And, but you want to have a lot of petals because if you place a tile and close it, now you can score for it. But you need to have the petals to be able to do that. And of course, if you don't spend pedals at the end of the game, you can get a lot of points for them. Or not a lot of points, but several points. This game does not overstay its welcome. I found it to be absolutely gorgeous on the table. It just feels different and unique. So if you like tile placement games that have sort of a wonky thing to them, like this doesn't feel like anything else, I think you would enjoy Flutter. I would give it a 7 out of 10. Flame and Fang, hey, you're a dragon. Be a dragon. You and your friends will be a group of dragons in this cooperative game where you start as a baby dragon and you will get stronger as you manage the aspects of your dragon to fight monsters. It's a deck building style game. Let me show you. We're not going to go into all the parts of this game. Uh, so just give you a quick idea. There's a story deck, which will give you a bit of a story. You'll start with the the, you're catching in the cave. It will show you how to set up the board. It will tell you what you're going to do. Some things will change as events come by. Rewards at the end, and then you'll go to chapter two, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a map here. You'll have your dragon pieces on the map, but you're mostly playing with a deck of cards here. You'll have a hand of cards, and on your turn, you're picking an aspect, one of these three aspects, and you can only play a card that matches that aspect although there are ways to change cards into other things. In each aspect, sort of has the same type of thing where 
the this aspect here, the the roam, this move aspect basically lets you move, and the bite lets you attack enemies that are going to be showing up on the board, and the seize is going to let you be grabbing resources that are going to show up on the board. The magic ones are going to let you play the bottom parts of your cards. Gold lets you change the aspects, although some aspects are wilds. There's a grow action, which lets you get rid of cards in your hand to take better ones. And you'll keep going until everyone passes. Then the enemies happen. More enemies will come out from the deck. Oh, look. There's an ogre, and now there's an Enten. And events will be pulled from this deck, although these events might, might be changed or added to based on the story that you're going through. And you'll keep going until you get to an end game victory condition or until you've lost. There are life cards that can go into your deck and get played again. Um, there's a, also a certain amount of resources you can hold. You'll notice one of your life cards has the possibility to hold that resource. So there's a, a bit of interesting deck building going on here. Let's go to my thoughts. Flame and Fang's biggest, biggest problem by far is it's boring. I wanted to like Flame and Fang more. The idea of having the three aspects sounds interesting, although it's like, well, it's my turn to do the move aspect. I will move. Next turn, I will attack. As the game goes by, you start upgrading your cards. You're like, I will move and then attack because I have the cards in my hand that allow me to do that, and I got a move card that also has an attack thing on it. But at the beginning, you're kind of going around grabbing resources, cooperating as I go, I'll take these resources. And you go, I, would, I wanted them. I'm like, well, yeah, but I also want them so I can upgrade. It's fine. But even like the, the, the territories, Mountain 1, Hill 1, and then the enemies, it just it feels very generic. The story's not particularly engaging. I think some people will enjoy the game, but I just really didn't. I just found everything to be really slow and plodding. There's no excitement to it, but there's also not interesting game mechanisms. It just feels like they had some interesting ideas with the three aspects and the cards that you play and the life going back in the deck. That, that's, that's stuff I, I don't mind, but I do mind that a game needs to give me some impetus to want to keep playing it over and over and flame and fang did not do that. So this one gets a 5 out of 10. Rim Racers is a game I was very excited about. It is a game about you and a remote control car and racing around a track. I like racing games, although it's really easy for racing games to not be good. There are many, many really good ones out there. As soon as I read the rules for this one, I knew some people would not like it, and I did not know where I would stand on it, because in this game you use templates. Templates are good for miniature games like X-Wing and other things. They're not often used for racing games. In fact, I don't think they've ever been used for racing games. Will it work? Let me quick show you what's inside the box. I'm not going to show you much of the game here because we're trying to make this short. Uh, but you're going to be racing your car around. You'll have your little console here. And these consoles, by the way, real pain to put together. But you'll keep track of your speed and other things on here. And they give you some stats here, which, by the way, are not balanced at all, oddly enough. Anyhow, you're going to be picking up cards that you're going to be playing over the course of the game. Equipment cards, proximity mines, multi-rifles. But what you're doing is, when it's your turn, you're going to be looking at your speed. So let's say my speed is 3. I will then take one of the three templates, and I'm going to be putting that in the front of my car and moving it from the front to the back, causing all sorts of havoc. You'll also be able to be shooting. Like I said, there's templates of, ooh, a fire template or maybe electricity and things that you'll shoot, and hitting walls and taking damage. And then that's sort of how the game works. You'll be running to the end of the track, and the first person there is the winner. Rim Racers does not work. It's slow and annoying. As you sit there and you find the template and you do it, racing games should be fast, 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 fast. They should be zooming and quick, and this one is not. This one just drags on. It's imprecise. The rules are horrific, so you might say I didn't play it right, because that's possible. It's too long. It's a 60 to 90 minutes. For what this game is, that's entirely too long. Cute little fast racing games where you shoot at each other are a dime a dozen. There are many of them out there. This one doesn't stand out at all. In fact, I would like to say I hate it. Um, nice miniatures, interesting ideas. It does not come together well. This is a 3 out of 10. Dirt side, I'm not going to do justice to this game with the shortness and brevity of what I'm about to say. Dirt side, or it's actually called Battle Stations Dirt side, is a sequel slash can be mixed with Battle Stations. Battle Stations from Jeff Sidek, Guerrilla Games, is a gigantic game. 
in which you are on a it's a, it's 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 essentially a role playing game in a box because you're a person who moves around a spaceship, but that spaceship also goes to planets, and then you go to planets and you. You go around, uh, not so much planets, but you go to space stations and stuff. So part of that game, you had a spaceship moving around a map. The other part, you were inside spaceships and space stations moving around. Dirt Side takes that same concept and is now bringing it, they take out the spaceship movement per se. You now have the spaceships that you can move around in, but you can, you're also landing on the planet. That's the name of the game, Dirt Side. Let's look in the box. So let's take a look at what's going on. Dirt Side is mostly involved in this book here. This is essentially an RPG, a role-playing game book. Uh, you're going to have a character, and you'll notice these characters have various stats on the side. The background shows kind of what they are. This, for example, is a scientist. They have some special abilities, and they're all over the place with different weird characters that you can be. You will be building planets using these boards. You'll see grids for them, and in fact, they even have in this gigantic book, there'll be a, there's a whole section on random planets that you can find with different things that will help happen on that planet. It just shows you the order to put them in. And then it will have in here missions. So this is the, the tutorial campaign, and then there's mission two. And you'll be moving around and fighting bad guys. The game is going to be using two-sided dice checks. So in this game, you're going to be making a lot of checks. So let's say there's a difficulty of nine, you'll roll two six-sided dice, and your abilities will subtract. Maybe I have an ability of two in that, so it would only be a seven I needed to roll or higher. So there are some missions in here, but there's a whole lot more in here. Again, realize what you're getting into when you play this. It's going to talk about threats and how the bad guys work. It's going to give you all the different actions that you can take. There's a big section on combat, engineering, piloting, many different special actions, terrain, and vehicles. A quick note here about vehicles, the game comes with a bunch of small tiles. Now, you'll notice here, these can be placed on the board as terrain. But the other side, you can build spaceships with these. So, for example, here's a human ship. This one's already put together. Uh, you can even cut these out if you want to use them, uh, rather than putting these together. But you're making a ship that you can then move around and interact with these ships. So there's a lot of stuff going on with vehicles. Um, there's tanks, heavy lifters, buildings, ship modules, car, and then these just talk about all the different rooms in the ship, what they do. You can create your own characters if you want to, rather than using one of the pre-built one. This explains all the special abilities. This tells you, look at that, drugs, new equipment. I already mentioned the planets. Uh, lots of different missions that can show up. And then a crossover campaign if you want to mix this with the original battle stations. So this is, like I said, there's a lot going in. This is not a game you're going to learn in 10 minutes, but it is deep and involved, and hopefully this gives you an idea of what it's like. Yeah, there's just too much here for me to really go into this in detail. This, for me, I'm just going to give my rating out of the way, is a 6 out of 10, but it's a 6 that I respect. Nowadays, where I'm at in board gaming, I don't have time to spend on this game. This says one to two hours per mission, but it's more than that. Because this is one to two hours per mission. And in fact, in the beginning, when you first open it up, they're like, welcome to the dirt side. And this is, it's, it's designed so you can open it up and start playing right away. Here's some references. You can kind of start playing right away, but you're going to look things up all the time. This is great. Don't get me wrong. I think that if you want to play a space game, a space RPG, that also has miniatures, there's a box of miniatures here, um, and a lot of predefined rules. You don't want to necessarily play to the whims of a, a, a game master. In fact, you don't need a game master for this. Then this is fantastic for you. Uh, I'm, I didn't mess with the compatibility to uh, Battle Stations itself, although you can see they're pretty much, there's a lot of similarities in the same game. It's One of the things I'll say about this world that I love is that all the aliens are aliens. They're not humans with horns or human Klingons or whatever. They're very alien. So that's neat. Um, and there's tons of variety and so much content in this box. So you should be able to tell from this review if that's something that you're interested in or if you would go, you know, I, I'd rather pass on this. This is, this is definitely going to be, this is not for everyone. But if you like the idea of a role-playing game world in a box with a fully realized, interesting, almost a little silly space thing, then you'll like Battle Station's Dirt Side. <laughs>
Happy Hoppers is a game for kids. Happy Hoppers is a game in which you have these little hopper pieces that you're going to be moving around and landing on top of other people on the board. Here's how. In this game, each player has three hoppers. On your turn, you'll roll these dice. This shows me I move the large hopper once, the medium one twice, and a small one twice. So what I might do is move my large one here once, then move my medium one, <laughs> which comes on top of the other one, and by the way, these don't, these, you'll probably have to glue them to keep them in their bases. And then a small one twice, which means now that I land on top of this guy, when he moves, mine goes along with it. If the island you land on is a pearl island, when you're done moving, you'll keep a pearl token, one or two points at the end of the game. If you land on a treasure island, you'll put a little crown, there's a crown, and that will give you extra points if you still have the crown at the end of the game, and can give you extra movement. If you play the advanced game, stacks can't go more than five, Big ones can't land on small, and if you land in surfboard islands, you get surfboards that you can keep and spend to get movement. When you go all the way around the board and cross your finish line, whoever does that first will end up here getting five, four, three, two, or one in the advanced game, or slightly less if you play the simpler game. The games play pretty similarly, but essentially you're rolling dice and landing on top of other people, letting them carry you with them, or being forced to carry other people. And that's how you play. This is a very nice game for kids. It's easy to move the piece around when you have a stack of, of pieces, you can move them there. The pearls being our one or two points. The surfboards letting you get extra movement. There's a lot. Now it's interesting that they have the base game and the advanced game. And if you said, Tom, which one's better? I don't know. Because some things like on the advanced game I like. I like the surfboards. I like the, the better scoring at the end. But the base game, the, the, the advanced game only has five stacks and Bigger ones can't land on smaller ones. So there's some, there's some restrictions that the base game is much more free. You just move and there's a whole stack of people moving. And it's funny, if you like games like Camel Up or, you know, the Pig Dash game or just these games where there's things on top of each other moving, this one will work well. My only caveat is you probably should glue the things together because they keep falling apart. But I do think it's fun, it's silly, it's light, it's fast, and kids are going to really enjoy it. A 7 out of 10 for me. Happy Hopper. Well, there you go, folks. Seven games. Some not so great. Some nice, good games. Check them out. Thanks for watching the Dice Tower. I'm Tom Vassell. We got more reviews on other great things in our channel. Until next time, you're watching the Dice Tower. Hey everybody, thanks for watching another video from the Dice Tower. Hey, you want to learn more about us? Communicate with us. We have a Facebook group. We have a Discord channel. Lots of different ways to get involved with the Dice Tower. You can find that in our Linktree link below. So just click that and it will take you and you can communicate with us on Facebook. Join our Facebook groups. There's lots of cool things that you can find and become part of the Dice Tower. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Tom Vassell.